YouTube is a massive platform with more than 1 billion hours of watch content every single day. Most of this content is for entertainment purposes. I recreated every single set from Squid Game in real life. Oh my God. Oh, let's ignore that. But some is meant to educate, hopefully while still being somewhat entertaining. Fear gives us life. You're, you're confident that I am not gonna be damaged. Not permanently. This so-called edutainment has issues. The constant compromise between these potentially opposing ideologies brings with it a breeding ground of miscommunication, profiteering, and straight up lying. Given this scenario, it's a completely valid question to ask, can you trust science YouTubers? After all, is it even in their best interest to tell you the truth? To address these questions, we need to look at four key points. Are they qualified? Have they published something that's incorrect? What is the level of clickbait that they use? And what type of sponsored content do they produce? With this said, we should ask ourselves, what standards should we hold science YouTubers to? Are we being reasonable or not? To start with, let's discuss qualification. For someone to discuss quantum computing, do we expect them to have a PhD in quantum computing? To have published multiple papers on quantum computing? And potentially to have taught a subject to university level? No. There are plenty of concepts in quantum computing that don't require this level of expertise to explain. And here we see with the first question that it's not a trivial answer. What qualification should we actually expect? After all, being a science communicator is not the same as being a scientist. You only have to go to one general conference to see that scientists in general are not good communicators. There are of course some great scientists that are also great communicators, but this is not the norm. Stars, just like human beings, have a lifetime. They are subject to the relentless march of time. Let's go to the moon. Yeah, there'll be a day when AI takes over and it'll make us their pets. Whatever God is, God is not luck. Whatever are they talking about? So should we expect a science YouTuber to be qualified as a scientist? A journalist? A producer? A filmmaker? The answer is any of these. Most of the larger science YouTubers do not have a PhD. While there are some that are still active scientists, most are not. Furthermore, there are very few that have a focused degree in science communication. Veritasium is an example of one person that does have a PhD in science communication, but most science YouTubers will only have experience in one aspect of science communication. And to be quite frank, the communication side may be more important than the science side. In the end, the important part of their qualification is are they a reliable source? For smaller channels, they may have to prove this with some additional qualification. Surely a PhD doesn't hurt here. For established YouTubers though, their body of work is the qualification. They've already proven that they are a world-class expert in science communication. And surely this gives them some science street cred. This takes us straight to the next point. When have these YouTubers presented something that is incorrect or misleading? And how have they reacted to that being pointed out? It is inevitable at some point, a science YouTuber will say something that is incorrect. It may be that they made a genuine mistake in their research or script. It could be that the science that they presented was later proven incorrect, or they could just be deliberately misleading people. One of the biggest science YouTube channels, Kurzgesagt, has made two videos on this topic. One describing mistakes they've made, which they then corrected by removing old videos and making new ones. Can you trust Kurzgesagt videos? To answer this question, we'll first explain how we research them and then talk a bit about past videos and what we want to achieve with the channel. And another one to discuss issues that arise from simplifying complex scientific ideas into easily understandable pieces, which inevitably loses nuance, details and caveats. Kurzgesagt is lying to you in every video, even in this one. 
But Kirk's Gesagt is not the only YouTube channel that's had this issue. Other large YouTube channels have also had similar problems. SciShow published a video on genetic modification, which they later took down and then updated with a new video to correct some of these inaccuracies and biased opinions of the first one. Hello, I'm Hank Green and this is SciShow. So we made a video about this once before, but some of the studies we cited turned out to be bunk and in general I think we played our cards too close to our chest when it comes to how we really feel about genetic engineering here at SciShow. And Crash Course ended up taking down a whole series on human geography after multiple issues with the research behind the videos was pointed out. I'm John Green and this is not Crash Course. Instead, I'm here to talk about why we're hitting the pause button on our human geography series to go back and rework it. But all of these are in fact good examples. Some mistake was made, which is completely understandable, and the appropriate action was taken by the creator to fix this. The important thing about being wrong is owning it and trying to fix that mistake. After all, science is not about being correct. It's about attempting to ascertain information that helps us paint a picture about the universe and everything in it, but always questioning whether we have a valid picture. Through hypothesizing and testing, hopefully we converge towards the truth, but we may never obtain that truth itself. But you may ask yourself, what if mistakes go undetected? Well, this might be a problem for small channels, as there's not enough people viewing the content to really criticize it in this manner. But for larger channels, we don't have to worry too much. There are plenty of people out there that are willing to point out every little flaw in every video made. You only need to type in Veritasium wrong into YouTube to find a slew of videos pointing out all of these flaws, some with over a million views themselves. So while you might not be able to detect this mistake, somebody will. And if you're still worried about if what they said was correct, then you can check their references. They should have them. And if they don't, that's a massive warning sign. On this point though, more is not better. Having a lot of references doesn't mean a video is well researched. A single review article that's written by experts in the field can be far more valuable than reading every single paper that it cites. As such, it's good practice not to assume a video is correct just because it has a large number of references. The next issue that arises on our ability to trust science YouTubers is what type of clickbait are they using? If you're watching this video now, it's likely that the thumbnail and title piqued your interest. And this is a form of clickbait, hopefully not a misleading one. There's a ridiculous amount of content on YouTube. To stand out in this vast sea of interesting videos, Clickbait is necessary. Veritasium has done a whole video on this in what he refers to as legit bait versus click trap. Now imagine a clickbait space where on one axis you have how misleading or sensationalized it is, and on the other, how much information is intentionally withheld to create a curiosity gap. The issue doesn't arise when someone uses clickbait. Remember the whole goal is to get you to watch some of their content so they can educate you on it. And that's not really the problem. The issue is when they deliberately mislead the viewer, promising something they may never deliver. This is a click trap. And this is not something we want for science communication. So if a creator is using this type of bad clickbait, then maybe this is a warning sign that you can't trust them that much, particularly if they're repeat offenders. If they're very good at making clickbait, then this may make them a good YouTuber. But if this falls often onto the click trap side, then this might not be the right impression that we want for science communication. This being said, the whole job of a science communicator is to try to communicate this science to as many people as possible. So this is somewhat of a conundrum. To use clickbait that is on the verge or even is a click trap, will get more people to watch it. But at the same time, if it's misused, then it will erode that trust that is so hard to obtain. Now, with larger channels, there does come the question of sponsored content. There have been occasions where science YouTubers have been called out for presenting a biased opinion due to sponsored content. Whether or not the integrity of these specific videos is legitimately in question isn't really the point. It's a valid concern in general. Clearly, content on YouTube is trying to sell us stuff of the time. People are constantly trying to sell us products. 
when it's a lifestyle channel, this is kind of accepted. After all, it is their job and they deserve to be paid for this. Well, the same is true for science YouTubers. They're allowed to be sponsored. A problem only arises when these science YouTubers misuse their trust to present opinion based on fact to get sponsored content through. This is a general problem on YouTube today, and we definitely don't want this to be prevalent in science YouTube. So a YouTuber being sponsored is not a problem, but shilling a product in a disingenuous way, misusing their trust, absolutely is. In total, we should hold science YouTubers to pretty high standards. They have an authority that requires this. However, they are also people that can make mistakes and they deserve the respect to be able to fix those mistakes. So provided they are transparent and that they fix mistakes and miscommunication, then they are already in a good state to deserve trust. Clickbait is a constant issue that these creators need to balance. So mistakes of overzealous titles and thumbnails will happen. But if they happen consistently, this could be a problem. Finally, they should not abuse their trust to sell products. Pretty simple there. In all of this, we've spoken about the standard that science YouTubers should uphold. But there are many other problems that we face today. We have news organizations and so-called experts that are peddling nonsense opinions as facts to millions of people. This epidemic of fake news and fake science is far more insidious and prevalent than many of us would like. So maybe rather than worrying about a small little thing that one science YouTuber got wrong, we should worry about these people that are deliberately misleading people for profit. Thanks for watching. Have fun. See you next time.